Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. If you're new to this channel, I'm a third year medical student here at University of Targo. So today what I want to talk about is UCAT. And UCAT stands for University Clinical Aptitude Test. So it is an admission test that's used in Australia, New Zealand, and some of the school in the UK uh, for their medical, dental school, and clinical science degree programs. So basically it is a test on your logic, your reading skills, and numeric skills, and also your moral codes. So for this test, you don't need any previous clinical or medically related knowledge. All you have to do for this test to prepare for it is to repeat its questions, uh, getting familiar with what kind of questions it's going to ask, and get yourself properly accustomed to them. So in New Zealand, it is required by two schools, the University of Auckland and University of Otago for their medical entry program. And at University of Auckland, it is required as 15% um, as your congregated school. So if you want to know more details, you can watch my University of Auckland versus Otago uh, medical school comparison. And for University of Otago, there's only a threshold that it needs to be met. The threshold is very, very low. It's only sitting at 20% for verbal reasoning and 10% for SJT, situation judgment test. So if you don't know what these two terms mean, it is two separate sections in the UCAT exam, and I'll further explain it in the later of the video. And there's also a dentistry program at Otago. It's the only dentistry school in the entirety of New Zealand. And their threshold is 630 for decision making, which is about 55%. And for verbal reasoning is 22%. And the good news for my fellow international students is that from this year onwards, the school has cancelled uh, the requirement of UCAT as part of the entry requirement because English is being seen as a second language for the international students. Wow! So the amount of time that you need to spend preparing for it is averaged out around 25 to 30 hours. On the official website, it recommends an hour of practice a day. You can do two or three up to oh, you. No. And the actual exam is going to be performed on a desktop computer with a full-size keyboard with a numpad. So if you don't know what that is, if you've been using your laptop for your entire life, it will be better if you can get used to it early on because the numpad is very important because that is essentially going to become a calculator. Now let's dive in and discuss each of the five sections in UCAT. So in UCAT, each of the sections is consists of 900 points and these five sections are verbal reasoning, decision making, quantitative reasoning, abstract reasoning, and situation judgment test. Wow. Usually when we refer to a UCAT score, it is referring to the first four sections and situation judgment test is kind of sitting there by itself as a separate category because it is more depending on your moral code and your common sense rather than the first four, which is your logical skills, your reasoning skills, and your reading skills. So let's start with verbal reasoning. So this compartment is the assessment of your ability to read and process information, and there's no prior knowledge needed for uh, any of the questions that they're going to ask. So one thing that's very crucial in this part is that you shouldn't make any assumptions based on your prior knowledge because they might be wrong or whatsoever. And don't overthink of any of the questions as the entire UCAT examination is incredibly time sensitive and just follow your own instinct if you can't decide. Select an answer, flag the question and come back later if you end up having time at the end. The general strategy for this part is to just skim read through the entire passage and try to identify any keywords by reading the questions and Remember, there's always evidence to support one of the statements in the answer, which is supposed to be correct. All right, so now let's uh, dive into some actual questions. So uh, there are mainly five types of questions in verbal reasoning. So we're going to start with TFC. So TFC basically just stands for true, false, that can tell the three options that you have as answer over here. And so to mark anything as true or false, you need very direct evidence, and by that I mean a direct sentence that states uh, basically what it says in the question. And if there's nothing there, if you need to make an inference to reach the conclusion that's being stated in the question, then it's going to be a cocktail. So let's look at this one here. So the question says the patients treated by the train all belong to the ruling party which runs the government country. So if you haven't read the entire passage here, just pause the video and have a quick scan through. So 
if you actually read the passage, you'll notice that it's quite easy to make an assumption that during the Civil War situation, it's quite easy to think that the medical train is only going to treat people from the supporter of their ruling party, but there is no explicit statement in the passage anywhere that's supporting the statement over here that, um, that all the trains are belong to the ruling party. So, and in passage 1 and 3, we are told the rulers needed to find a way to treat their followers who had been injured in the Civil War, but there's nothing to say that these are the only people who received treatment on the train. And passage 3 tells us how many people have been treated, but not whether they are uh, or have to be members of a particular party to access the treatment. So the answer here is going to be can't tell. Alright, and let's look at the second question type, which is called incomplete statement. Basically, there's a sentence that's going on here that's going halfway through. So, Ministry of Justice research supports the use of restorative justice. And then you got to finish the sentence off with either A, for minor crimes only, B, because a victims like it, C, uh, for the first time offenders only, and D, because it is cost effective. So, take some time to actually read the passage. Alright, so if you have finished it, let's go through each option uh, separately. So for um, A, it says for minor crimes only, and this is incorrect because in the passage there is reference to uh, serious offenses. And this can be seen over here at the bottom, the Ministry of Justice research into restorative justice for serious offenses such as violent crime and burglary. So A is definitely incorrect. And B, because victims like it. So it could be correct, there's a chance it does sound like um, the, the victims would prefer this way better, but we have no evidence, and we only have evidence uh, from this one specific manager of the fast food outlet in Brixton. So this is not strong enough to make a judgment uh, concerning all the victims in general. And C, for first time offenders only. So it's not correct because there's no reference um, at all to first-time offenders or like repeated offenders in anywhere of the passage and D because it is cost-effective and is being stated in the last passage here and it says show the approach reduced re-offending by 25% and for every one pound spent on providing restorative justice nine pounds are saved for the criminal justice system in reduced crime compared to community punishment or prison services alone. So the answer for this one is obviously D. And now let's look at the next type of question, which is according to passage, and that's just what it's called, and basically it's because it always starts with according to the passage. So the answer for this one is A, and it's supported by the evidence in the paragraph 2. Uh, which says in 1662, when King Charles II needed the money, instead of introducing a poll tax which people could evade by moving from one area to another, so William Petty proposed to tax in his and five places in the property people occupied. And the fourth type of question is called accept, and basically, in this kind of question, you gotta find the one that's not being stated in the passage versus all the other ones that there is only one that's being supported in the passage. So. All the other three are correct, only one is going to be wrong. So, um, A can be supported by information in the first paragraph, and B is supported uh, by the information in the second paragraph, and C is from the fourth, whereas D is not reflected in anywhere of the passage, and it's therefore the right answer, but it's wrong at the meantime, if that makes sense. And the last one we're going to talk about here is called most likely. So this is the part where you need to make some inference based on the information given in the passage. So this is different than the all the, all the other ones. The other ones tells you not to guess. You need to find direct evidence supporting the statement. But in this one, you got to sort of guess a little bit. So the right answer for this one is be the members of the government and this is supported uh, by the sentence in the second paragraph if we look over here many dramatists leading up to the late 1730s criticized the government and royal family 
Decision making. So decision making is the assessment of your ability to apply logical reasoning to reach a decision or a conclusion with the given information. And you shouldn't let any previous questions to affect your judgment and the further on questions because they're all separated. Okay, and now let's look at some specific examples for uh, decision making. So um, the first one that we're going to talk about is called a logical puzzle and basically there are many things that's going on over here. So to solve this type of questions, uh, make good use of the whiteboard that you're given. And also remember you don't have to work the entire thing out and just whatever is the most necessary for you to um, attain the answer and this question is a very perfect example of showing that. Alright, so once you have read through the question, we're going to go through the actual process of solving this. So we're going to always start from the most easiest one. Vikram likes to scream, so his response is scream. But we don't know the animal, and we're going to put the animal in the middle. So we're going to skip that and the scream. So you can do the same process on the whiteboard, it'll be very similar. And Saskia is scared of mice, so we know Saskia is scared of mice. And uh, Jake is scared of slugs. So all these really easy, straightforward ones are gonna make us make our life so much easier. Okay, the person who hit is not scared of spiders. Okay, so that's not very useful at the moment. And the person who refused to get off the coach. So we already have two animals over here. Vikram cannot be frogs because he we know he screamed. So it's definitely Hillary who is scared of frogs and who is uh, refused to get off the coach. Right? And so that left uh, that left Vikram with the spidey over here. Alright, so we still don't know the response for Saskia and Jake, and I don't think we can figure them out as well. So that's the part where you need to pay attention that you don't need to figure out the entire thing, just whatever is the most necessary. Okay, so now let's look at the answer, which one must be true. So Hillary hid, uh, did Hillary hide? Hillary didn't hide. Did Jake cry? Jake didn't. Uh, we don't know about that. And uh, uh, see, Vikram is scared of spiders. And uh, we already have that over here. Vikram is scared of spiders. So C is definitely the right answer over here. Now let's move on to the next one, which is called uh, syllogism. So uh, this is basically you get two statements at the top. Uh, so this one is quite uh, simple and straightforward. And basically you need to um, make a conclusion that whether the bottom conclusions are true or false. And true means they're 100% true, but if there's only a chance that this might be true, then you're going to put a no for that one. So for this one, one of the strategy you can use is to convert uh, some of these words into percentage, which is so much more straightforward. So for example, if um, all the boys are asleep, you can write down 100% boys are asleep, and Uh, so over here, none of the boys are awake. So basically, essentially what that's saying is 0% of boys is awake, which corresponds with uh, the 100% boys are asleep. So that will be a yes. And the next one is none of the girls are asleep. There's nothing that we can... So if you translate that into percentage, it will be 0% of girls is asleep. So we have nothing about the sleeping status of the girls. So this will be a no. It might be true, but it might not be. And the next one is all of the girls are awake. So same as the, the one above, 100% of the girls are awake, which will be a no because we know nothing about girls. And more children are awake than are asleep. So the percentage of awake is higher than the percentage of sleep. Uh, we know 100% of the boys are asleep, but we don't know the total amount of um, number of the girls, and we don't know their sleeping status, therefore it can be true or false, and therefore that's a no over here. And at least two of Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Baker's children are asleep. So this one's a bit of a tricky one. So two of Mrs. Baker's. So we know all the boys are asleep. And because it uses the plural S over here, boys, that means there are at least two boys. Or one and a half, but you can't really have one and a half boys. So, this statement 
uh, despite you need a bit of thinking over there and uh, you kind of need a little bit of inference, but it would be true. So the final answer will be yes, no, 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 yes. Alright, and move on to the next one. Over here, so this type of questions uh, tests your ability to interpret the information and draw conclusions. So, and there's always some sort of graph or chart, and it's relatively easy and straightforward. So, if we look over here, we have caffeine, volatile substance, organic acid, and um, always remember to go through the uh, go through the statements on top because they're usually quite important. And blah, 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 blah. Okay, so uh, coffee brew extracted at four minutes is the least flavorful. So we know flavor is corresponded with um, uh, volatility. So if we look at the volatility over here at four minutes, it has peak volatile substance. Basically, what that means, it has peak amount of flavor. So it would be a no for this one because it's completely false. Uh, some people might mi make the mistake of confusing, you know, all of these lines. So just pay extra attention because if you mistakenly think the caffeine is the line for the volatile substance, you might get this one wrong. And the next one is among the three components, caffeine is the quickest to dissolving water. So definitely true because it's the steepest line right after the start. So that would be a yes. And someone who prefers bitter coffee should brew it for at least seven minutes. So we know the bitter taste comes from the organic acid, and organic acid is represented by this thick line over here. And around seven minutes, it does peak. So that would be a yes. And for a perfectly aromatic cup of coffee, the powder should be ground finely. So there's nothing mentioned about grounding, uh, grounding the powder. So that would be a no because it's not being stated even if it's true. The higher the temperature of the water, the more bitter the taste of coffee. So we have we know nothing about this one. It could be true, but this is a time um, to the amount graph, not a uh, temperature to amount graph. So that would be a no as well. So the only yes are the, uh, are the second and the third one over here. Okay. And then the next type of question is recognizing assumptions. So those ones are slightly more tricky. You need to find out the strongest argument over here. And remember, a strongest argument is sort of similar to verbal reasoning. You need to have direct evidence provided in it. Of course, for this one, you don't have anything to refer to. But um, some of the concrete evidence um, that are being recognized are things like numeric data, something very specific, and something that is not based on an opinion or like a random assumption. So, A, yes, less than 300,000 of the 3 million plastic bottles thrown away each day are recycled. So, we don't know if this statement is true, but it is a very specific statement stating exactly how much is being thrown away and are being recycled. Okay, and B, yes, all plastic water bottles that are not recycled are incinerated, releasing harmful gases into the atmosphere. So it does seem convincing, but the problem with this statement is that it didn't state how much of the water bottles are being incinerated. They're just saying all the ones that are, that are not recycled are being incinerated. Also remember, each one of the statements are separate. They are not correlated to each other. So it's not like uh, the non not recycled uh, amount is being stated over here. No, they are completely unrelated arguments and we should look at them individually. So we don't know how much is not being recycled and also we don't know how harmful the gas is and how much impact is it, does, uh, is it producing to the atmosphere. And look at C, no, if plastic, bottle, uh, if plastic water bottles were banned, people would drink less water, which would be a serious health risk. Okay, but how much less water is people going to drink and how serious is the health risk going to be? It just seems very general and very opinionated. And D, no, bottled water is cleaner than tap water, which is particularly important for those in developing countries. So again, sort of the same problem that it's not being um, very uh, specific. It's an assumption. We don't know how much of the bottled water sold in developed countries is actually tap water and um, because it can just be unfiltered water being packaged. And now we're going to look at another type of question in this decision-making part. So this is called the Venn diagram. 
And basically, you're giving a statement and you need to find the perfect match for this one. So if you look at this, there's a blah, 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 total of 22. And something you can quickly do is to add all of these numbers up, which should all equal to 22. Nice. And now we have 15 products containing wheat. Six of these products use a wheat base and nine use three ingredients. So now we know six only uses wheat. So six should be on the outside. Nine should be in the middle because it uses all three ingredients. And if you look at them, A, B, C, D, all have these components. That's what make these type of questions annoying because you actually need to read through everything. Okay. One product uses two base ingredients. Okay. So if you look at this one, right? The one is over here, it's using two ingredients, but if one is sitting over here, remember the six, nine, sorry. Sorry, children. Sorry, kids. Six, nine circle um, is representing wheat, and we only have 15 products over here, so that's going to make it 16, and that's definitely wrong. And same problem over here, that makes it uh, 16, and this one makes it 16, and this one doesn't because the one is sitting over here so d is likely to be only uh, to be the only one that's correct and let's just confirm the rest and the same uh, number of products use rice only as use maize only so three and three all is in the all and its individual circle and that definitely looks correct to me so the correct answer for this question is d and the last type of question is called probabilistic and statistical reasoning. So this is um, a testing on your knowledge on calculating probability. So if you're not so sure about that one, just brush up on that one. Okay, so remember, if you remember the tree diagram, you do a 0 0.3 on one side and the 0 0.7 on one side. And from the 0 0.3, you branch into 0 0.3 and 0 0.7. And from the 0 0.7, you branch into a 0 0.3 and another 0 0.7. So, is he right? Is he more likely to win at least one game than not? The probability of winning one game and losing one game is 0 0.3 times 0 0.7 times 2, uh, which gives you 0 0.42. And the probability of winning both games is 0 0.3 times 0 0.3, and that gives you 0 0.09. So if you combine both, that is 0 0.51. That's the probability of them winning at least one game. So the correct answer for this one is B, because the probability... That's 0.51 as we calculated. Quantitative reasoning. So quantitative reasoning is the assessment of your ability to process numeric data and to apply them to very specific situations. And you will be provided a calculator, not re technically a calculator, it's a calculator that's built into the app. Therefore, you need to use the numpad keyboard to quickly calculate the result out. And that's why you need to get used to the numpad keyboard as early on as possible and practice your exam with a full-size keyboard with a numpad, don't just do it on your laptop. And also just be aware the calculator is not always the fastest way to process certain calculation. Let's say if you're doing 6 plus 7, if you punch that in the calculator, it's going to take quite a bit of time, and if you're just doing your brain, you're just immediately going to come up with 13. And in a time-sensitive test like UCAT, that most of the people can't even finish all the questions, it's extremely important to remember to combine your calculator and your brain, your mental calculation all together. And remember, it's always going to be a multi-step calculation uh, involved in one of these questions. So there won't be any simple calculations and you will always need to uh, combine data from everywhere. And remember, not all the number data are expressed in the way of numbers. For example, if they give you a question like how many petrol, how much petrol they consumed in a week, uh, a week is seven days. So you got to convert that into seven. And during the test, you will also be given a whiteboard. So uh, make good use of that and take good notes. Okay, so now let's look at some specific examples for quantitative reasoning. There's always a lot of numbers. Just remember that you got to deal with that. And what's the difference in their fuel consumption for the term? Okay, so fuel consumption and their round trip in a town. So they're in a town that's over here. And that's the difference between 10.3 and 9.7. And that's 0 0.6. So you need to times 0 0.6 uh, by 12, which is 12 weeks. And in each week, they go to the school for five days. 
and but it's a round trip, so we need to time another two as well. So it's zero point six times twelve times a five times a two and times a twelve kilometers. But this is per hundred kilometers, so we can need to divide by another hundred. And if you punch that into your calculator, it should be eighteen liters over here. All right, so it's just all calculation pretty much. And for this next one over here. So basically, in a year in which there was the least uh, percentage increase in the urban mobile from the previous year, was a approximate percentage increase in rural population. So rural population, we know we're looking at rural areas from the previous year. So um, before we start, right, if you want to punch out and calculate all the percentage between all these years, then sure, you can. But if we do a rough estimate, we can see here almost have a 700 people increase. Here it has another 700, nearly 400 people increase. And over here, it's only a 50 increase. So obviously this one is the least one. So if you just do a rough estimate in your head, it's going to save you so much more time. And if you just divide um, 3426 by 3377, you're going to get a number that's 1.0145. And that gives you um, option A over here. Okay, and next one. Next one is a graph. Um, Question. So the graph shows the distribution. So what is the average rate of increase of the median? So median we know we're looking at the middle line. Okay, between birth and one year old. So one year old that will be twelve months over here. So when you're doing the actual exam, just remember to uh, read through the question and. Uh, look at all the key terms because you don't want the 36 right? right so if you look at the increase over here it starts from 50 and it ended on 76 so that's uh, 20 26 and here is per month so 26 uh, divided by 12 which should give you a 2.17 or 2.2 that's the closest answer you can get so that would be a C Abstract reasoning. So this is about finding implicit patterns amongst very um, abstract shapes. You'll understand what I'm talking about when I show you the actual questions. And there's also a lot of irrelevant and distracting factors uh, within the question that can be very disturbing. So the thing to remember is that in this section, you can't always find the patterns. Some of them are incredibly difficult and can be a combination of multiple rules. So if you can't find them, do the same thing, just flag, uh, select the answer, flag it, and skip it. And come back if you really have time, but usually you just don't. So, some of the general rules of this section. There is shape, arrangement, rotation, number, color, shading, inter uh, intersection, touching size, enclosure, and combination. So these are the common emerging patterns. There can be an involvement of two or three rules added up together. So it can get really confusing and very distracting sometimes. So. Some of the easy strategies to go through all of these is always, always start from the simplest box, the box with the least shape because there's the least amount of distraction. And remember at the beginning of the test, in between each section, you have one minute of preparation time. And you can just use this one minute of preparation time to jot down all the common rules that uh, I just mentioned about. And during the test, you can easily refer to them and going through all of them. And Last but not the least, I can't emphasize more on this, is to skip if you can't figure out the pattern. Don't waste your time on overthinking one specific question just to get it right, because even if you get that one right, you might lose the time of solving another eight. Okay, now let's look at some actual questions for abstract reasoning. So this part is quite tricky, as you can see the question here, you're like, what is this? Okay, if we look at the pattern over here, There's obviously no consistency in the numbers because they all change, change numbers and they're all odd numbers on each side. And if you look more carefully, you probably already have figured it out. You can see a symmetry in set B and a symmetry in set A that goes horizontally versus the vertically in set B. If you look at the test shape over here, right? So it's symmetrical in a horizontal way. So that means it belongs to set A. But also over here, if we rotate this one by 45 degrees and all the lines are pointing upwards into this corner over here, 
right? And the symmetrical line is actually diagonal instead of either horizontal or vertical, then it would not be set A or set B and it will be neither. So this is a relatively straightforward one. In the extra, extra question, you can get much more complicated one. If you can't solve it, just flag skip. This type of question is called nixing line, and usually in this type of questions always involve certain rotation. And if we look at this one over here, we can obviously see the square over here is rotating by itself, but also changing corner every single time. If the ball goes here, 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 and we know in the final graph that it's going to be here, and the ball should be pointing into the bottom right corner, so that gives us A, B, and D. And now we look at the triangle, right? Triangle goes here, here, here. Here, here, so it's gonna here, here, so it's gonna be on the right. So all of them are correct. Oh, when you look at the ball now, right? It goes black, white, black, white, black. So that excludes option D. So A and B now. So is it at the bottom, or is it here? So if you look at it, right? Every single time it changes its position to a different side. So bottom, right, left, bottom. So the next in line is gonna be on the right side, which is over here. So the answer is option A. Okay, so it's quite easy to fall into the trap just because um, you see the B as say, uh, the same as the initial one and you're like, oh, they look, they look the same, it must be going in cycles, so obviously it's going to be B. Just be really careful, the, the question here is actually A, the kind of little dot over here can be tricky. This one is the complete statement. Basically, you need to find what kind of change has happened in the first set, and you need to apply the same change to the second set and find the answer. And just give yourself some time and see if you can solve it by yourself. Okay, so this one um, is quite tricky because there's no pattern in the, in the shape change, right? Uh, the square can go into that. Uh, a rectangle that's horizontal, but the square goes into this, and this circular shape over here is still a circular shape, but the um, circular shape over here turning to a triangle. Um, so it's not very confusing, and there's no change in uh, angles, right angles, or so. So uh, for this one, if you actually look at the regions, how it's being divided, you'll see that the square only has one region over here, whereas here it's being divided into two, and this one has two regions divided into three, two regions into three and one regions into two. So, um, in fact, the pattern for this one is that for each one of these, there's an increased region. So the uh, for the bottom bit, right? So one region, you're supposed to have two over here, that fits B, and this one, one region, should have two, that fits B, C, D as well. This one, three regions, should have four, that's only two, that's four over here, so that fits, and this one is two, it needs to go into three, which give us letter C over here. Okay, last one. It's literally the same as the first type of questions that we run through, but uh, this one doesn't have the neither. It just you gotta find a right shape. Okay, so if we actually look at it, we notice something very obvious is that there's no black dot on the left side and there's black dot on the right side. So obviously that's gonna be one of the PCD. So remember, if there's intersections, right, always remember some of the key features at intersection. What kind of shape are at intersection, right? Is it just straight lines or there can be curved lines? So obviously it's not just straight lines, there can be curved lines coming out of the intersection as well. And also another common feature of the intersection is how many lines are coming out of there. So if you look at that, um, three lines of the black, three lines out of the black, two lines of the white, Three lines out of the black, 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 two lines out of the white. But usually in abstract reasoning, we don't get specific numbers like two or three, it's usually odd or even. So if you look at B, C, and D, right, all the white dots in D have odd numbers just like in set B. All the uh, black intersection are having odd numbers, and uh, we're not having that in B or C, but only in D. So therefore, D is the right answer. And the last section is the situation judgment test. So there are five aspects in this test. It is the testing of your perspective taking, your integrity, your adaptability, your resilience, and your team involvement. 
So some uh, this is a test on basically your moral code and your, your common sense as I mentioned and some of the fundamental principles that you always need to remember to follow is to set aside all personal biases and beliefs and the patient's well-being and safety should always be your top priority and there should be no disrepute of your profession so if there's any unprofessional behavior just don't even think about it and always maintain confidentiality, always treat others with respect, sensitivity, and you shouldn't be dismissive at any time. Always consider uh, patient interviews, uh, their mental capacity should always be included in their treatment consideration. Remember to collaborate with other people, there shouldn't be anything like dishonesty or misleading um, response. This is just immediately an inappropriate response. All the positive and negative feedbacks are just part of the normal learning response. And always seek help and seek support. There should be six questions in each scenario. And when you're doing all these questions, don't consider the time frame because even if a behavior is appropriate but uh, couldn't be done immediately, you should always consider that as appropriate. This is listed in the guideline of the UK official website, so just remember that. Judge the response independently from other questions. All the questions are unrelated. You can have six questions of one scenario all being really appropriate or really important. So don't have the mentality of, oh, I've already picked three appropriate responses for this scenario so the last three must be inappropriate or something. There's no balancing number and it can be just all appropriate or inappropriate. The questions in this section is quite straightforward and don't need much explanation. Therefore I skipped it and the video is getting a bit too long anyways but let me know if you guys want a demo for this section. And some of the really good resources that I personally used um, during the preparation for this exam is that I actually went onto the official YouTube channel of UCAT. They actually do have a YouTube channel and they have a lot of guidance on their website so you should definitely check it out. A lot of my information are taken from there and they also have loads of practice questions they can use. Common Medics, which is a YouTube channel if you haven't heard of him. He is a YouTuber, medical student YouTuber from uh, King's College in London and he's incredible at explaining how to solve each one of these questions individually and I do reckon he does a much better job than me. And Medify, Medify is a website that you can pay for and personally I paid for a month of subscription that cost me 100 or five New Zealand dollars, which is fifty pounds, or an Australian dollar. You can just do the conversion yourself. It's a bit. It's quite similar to New Zealand. And if you want more proper preparation, you can also pay one hundred and thirty for two months, or even more for four month, eight month. If you really want to be very well prepared for it, uh, for the situation judgment test, there are some books that you can go through. So there's um, one guideline called the Good Medical Practice. And then Colin, a code of conduct for doctors in Australia. That's the entire name of the of the book. And another one is just called Good Medical Practice, and it's from the Medical Council of New Zealand. So both both of these contains information about how you should um, perform your medical career ethically and morally, and it is essentially what the situation judgment test is entirely based on. And uh, we have come to the end of the video, so just let me know if you want a discussion on any specific topics. Otherwise, leave any questions in the comment section below. Feel free to send me an email or chuck me a DM. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye!